Okay, uh, good to see you this morning. We're on lesson three uh, of our series, the four R's of Bible prophecy. Okay, let's look to God in prayer and we'll begin. <coughs> Dear Heavenly Father, as we come before you today, we come in the only name that is that one name that is above every name, the only name in which we can approach you with the name of Jesus. And we pray for, not for ourselves, but uh, for his sake, in his name. We ask you, Lord, to bless this time together and may the Holy Spirit minister here to each and every heart that is in this place. And as the word of God, the prophetic word is unfolded this day, Lord, we pray that uh, it might be um, uh, tasted, uh, swallowed, digested, and provide spiritual food for each one of your people. So Lord, we pray now that as we study the word of God, may the name of Jesus be uplifted and glorified and may his praise and his glory fill this auditorium. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, the four R's of Bible prophecy. The first one is the rapture of the church. The second one is the resurrection of the body. And we've covered that the last two weeks. And now we come to the third one, the revelation of Jesus Christ. The revelation of Jesus Christ. And that word revelation means to disclose or unveil. So when we talk about the revelation, it's unveiling the, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now there's another name for the revelation of Jesus Christ that is more frequently used. It's called the second coming, the second coming of Christ. All right, but it's actually the revelation. Notice in the note sheets that you have there, the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, it begins by saying the revelation of Jesus Christ, the disclosing or the unveiling of Jesus Christ. Now in the book of Revelation, you have beasts and antichrist and trumpet judgments and bowl judgments and the opening of the seals and you have uh, swarms of demons and you have all kinds of things in the book of Revelation, but it's not a revelation of those things. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ. It's Jesus being revealed in God's eternal plan of the ages here. So it's the revelation of Jesus Christ, the unveiling or the disclosure. Then in 2 Thessalonians 1, 7, and to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be, and here's the word again, revealed. He's going to be unveiled. He's going to be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. That's the second coming. Then in 1 Peter 1, 13, wherefore gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is brought unto you at the revelation or the unveiling of Jesus Christ. Here again, that's the second coming. And Luke 17, 30, even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In other words, the second coming. Now it's important that we do not confuse the rapture and the revelation. And this is something that Christians are prone to do. And they, they get them all mixed up sometimes. And they'll use verses that talk about the revelation to try to fit the rapture into that. Or they'll use verses that talk about the revelation, the, uh, the rapture, and try to fit the revelation into that. And, and so it's important that we rightly divide the word of truth. And the, what you have to do to rightly divide, of course, is to study. There's no shortcuts. You have to study the word of God and, uh, and to, to, to understand these things. I'll, if you take in your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 17, I want to show you one of the l greatest errors in the Christian church concerning Bible prophecy. This, this error is so prevalent today in Bible teaching. You've got guys on television, you have tapes and uh, videos and so forth that you can buy. There are books in the Christian bookstores that make this great, great error. And I want to have you look at it and understand the context in which it is, it is being taught. You know, you can take a verse out of context and you can make it read anything you want it to. 
But you have to look at the context. Somebody said a, uh, a verse taken out of context is a pretext, and that's what it is. Okay, in Re uh, Luke chapter 17, beginning at verse 26, and as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. In other words, like it was in Noah's day, will be in the days just before Jesus' coming. Verse 27, they did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Notice life was going right on as usual, business as usual, until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And that very same day, within that 24 hour period, it says the flood came and destroyed them all. Then verse 28, likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot. They did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. Here again, business as usual. It's going right on, but verse 29 says, but the same day, the same day, just like it did with Noah, the day he went into the ark, the flood came. Here it says, the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. And then Jesus says in verse 30, even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. And here's our word revealed again, or revelation. At the revelation of Jesus Christ, it's going to be a time of judgment. The flood was a time of judgment. The fire and brimstone upon Sodom was a time of judgment. And what he's talking about here, of course, is the tribulation period, because the tribulation period is going to end with the personal return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's read on. Verse 31. In that day, here's the time element here, in that day, in that day, he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back, because this is going to happen so fast. All right? Remember Lot's wife. Lot's wife just paused just long enough to turn around, and judgment, God's judgment fell upon her. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. And so Jesus here is talking about the, in the tribulation, at the end of the tribulation period, his revelation his coming back from heaven it is accompanied by the judgment the flood was a judgment in noah's day fire and brimstone was a judgment in lot's day and there's going to be judgment at the return of or the revelation of the lord jesus christ in that future day now he describes that judgment and here's the big error of a lot of christians verse 34 i tell you in that night that there shall be two men in one bed the one shall be taken and the other left. How many times have you heard that verse or some of these other verses here that follow? How many times have you heard that preached? That's the rapture of the church. That is not the rapture of the church. It has nothing to do with the rapture of the church. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptic gospel, there is not even a hint of the rapture. This has nothing to do with the rapture. This is all about judgment. He uses the example, the flood and Sodom. This is all about uh, a, a judgment and fleeing from that judgment, as verse 31 says. That, the rapture has nothing to do with that. The rapture is signless and timeless. It's just a blast on the trumpet and miraculously, God's church is, is translated out. It, it will just disappear. Millions of Christians will all disappear in the moment and in the twinkling of an eye. All right, let's read on. Two women shall be grinding together, one shall be taken and the other left. And then verse 36, two men shall be in the field, one shall be taken and the other left. Three times we have this word taken. Where are they going to be taken? It doesn't mean taken up to heaven. It means taken in tribulation judgment. Now you say, how do you know that? Can you prove that? Yes. Verse 37. They answered and said unto him, Where, Lord? Where are they going to be taken? They, they'd not heard this before. Where are they going to be taken? Here's his answer. 
He said unto them, Wheresoever the body is, thither will the eagles be gathered together. You look up at the sky and you see the birds of prey circling up there. You know that down on the ground, right under them, are the, uh, the bodies, the carcasses of, of all of those that have, uh, that have been taken in the judgment. And the Bible tells us in the book of Revelation that at that time there's going to be so much flesh for the birds of prey to eat that it'll be virtually coming out of their mouths. Um, uh, that's at the uh, what we call Armageddon. So this, this chapter is not talking anything about the rapture of the church it's all, it's, uh, at all. It's, being, it's talking about being taken in tribulation judgment. So it's imperative that as we study the scriptures, we keep the rapture and the revelation separated. Don't get them mixed up or you get into some really, really false doctrine. And that's where a lot of this uh, false teaching about uh, prophecy, that's where it originates by not rightly dividing the word of truth. Now let's ha have a little contrast here between the rapture and the, re and the revelation. Now let me give you a word to the wise right now before we start this. Write down the scripture verses you're going to see up on the screen in just a moment or two so that you can remember them and have them before you because they're not in the lesson for the most part. And so you write them down and uh, when we put a verse up there and um, it'll help you to keep the rapture and the revelation straight in your mind. Okay, first of all, the rapture. The rapture is regarding the church. It has to do with only the church, nothing else. The revelation, on the other hand, is regarding Israel. Now, the whole world is involved in the tribulation period but, uh, and the second coming of Christ, the revelation, but it's primarily Israel. It's to, to Israel. So you got the church, the rapture is concerning the church, the revelation is concerning Israel. That's where Jesus is going to come back and and become the king of Israel and of the whole world. All right, secondly, the rapture is the removing of the church from the earth. And the revelation is the restoring of Israel to the land. So the church is taken up, but in the revelation, Israel is restored into the land. There won't, in that day, there will not be a Palestinian state over there. In that day, there will be no bombs or terrorists over there. It's going to be the government of God upon earth. That's the purpose of the second coming, is for Jesus to set up his kingdom, and Israel is going to become the head nation. Many, many scriptures back this up. Then thirdly, and concerning the rapture, he's coming for us. Now, what we read in uh, first, uh, I'm sorry, in John chapter uh, 14, Jesus said, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That's the rapture. Where I am, there you may be also. Where's that? That's up in heaven. He says, I'm coming back. I'm going to uh, take you up to heaven. That where I am, there you may be also. For Thessalonians 4.17, uh, then we which are alive and remain should be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, not on earth, in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So he is coming for us. The revelation, on the other hand, he's coming with us. He's coming with us. We read in Revelation 19:11, he's coming on a white horse, heaven is open, Behold a white horse, it's Jesus sitting on the horse. He's called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. And in the 14th verse of that same chapter, the armies which were in heaven followed him on white horses. Who is these, this armies of him that's in heaven? It's the church, the church which has been raptured seven years earlier, following him on white horses. And so um, the rapture, he's coming for us. The revelation, he's coming with us. We're going to be kind of like window dressing as the Lord Jesus 
puts down the Antichrist and, and all of the uh, uh, forces of evil and sets up his kingdom here upon the earth. We're, we're going to be more like uh, spectators. I don't think he needs us to do anything. He's able to do it all by himself because in that same scripture, it tells us that out of his mouth went a sharp sword, which is the word of God. He's going to do it all with his word. Then we find that uh, the, the rapture involves nobody but believers. The wording that we read in 1 Thessalonians is the dead, uh, the dead in Christ, that's believers, dead in Christ, and then we, the church, which are alive and remain and, and so forth. So th this is uh, believers only in the rapture, at the rapture, only the believers. But the revelation is going to involve everybody. And then going back to the other side there, the rapture is not going to be seen by the world. See, that's the revelation th that is going to be seen, not the rapture. So when, in a flash, in a twinkling of an eye, when the church, millions of Christians, are suddenly, just like that, oh, that's even too slow. See, it's going to be faster than that. But when we are, are supernaturally translated out of here, it's going to happen so fast, the world's not going to see anything. But when Jesus comes back again at his revelation, they're going to see plenty because we read then that behold, he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him. They also which pierced him, that's the Jews, and all the kindreds of the earth, that's the Gentiles, shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. So he's not seen at the rapture. And he is seen by everybody at the revelation. Then for the church, at the rapture, we receive a heavenly inheritance. A heavenly inheritance. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 3, in verse 1, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. The church has a heavenly calling. We have our heavenly people. Our rewards are in heaven. Israel, on the other hand, is an earthly people and uh, they have an earthly inheritance. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. That isn't, wasn't written to the church, it's written to Israel. The church is not going to inherit the earth. Now the Catholic Church teaches that they are the kingdom of heaven and that they have a right to inherit the earth, but that is, I mean, that's totally unbiblical. And a lot of the reformers, when the Reformation took place, that's one of the rags of Rome that they kept. And so you have a lot of the Reformation Protestant churches that are still teaching that today, but it's totally false. That's to Israel, to the Jews, Jesus is speaking there. This is another great prophetic error that the church has hung on to that is erroneous an erroneous teaching here it's israel that is going to inherit the earth they're an earthly people with an earthly calling and an earthly inheritance and an earthly reward the church is a heavenly people with a heavenly calling and a heavenly inheritance and a heaven and heavenly reward so that's the difference there well let's move on continuing on here now jesus is coming to reward this is the rapture He's coming to reward his people. And we read in Revelation 22, Behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me. My reward is with me. He's, uh, he's going to come and reward us. That'll be at the judgment seat of Christ. And then in 1 Peter, And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. So we're going to be rewarded. All right? But... On the other hand, the, at the revelation, he's coming not to reward, but to judge. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7 through 9. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus will be revealed, here's our word, revealed, revelation, shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Those verses have nothing to do with the rapture. That's the revelation, and it's all about judgment, 
and so forth. All right, and let's continue on there. Jesus is the head of the church. Colossians 1.18, it says he is the head of the body, which is the church. Israel, on the other hand, to Israel, on the other hand, he is the king of Israel. He is the, the king of, of Israel. Uh, it, at the birth of Christ, the angel announced he shall be great. He shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give him the throne of his father David. That's right here on earth. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob. That's right here on earth forever. And of his kingdom. That's right here on earth. There shall be no end. So he's the head of the church. He's the king of Israel. Jesus is not the king of the church. He's the head of the church. But to Israel, he will be the king. The king of Israel sitting upon the throne of his father David. To the church, I should say concerning the church, he is the bridegroom and the church is the bride. We read in Ephesians chapter 5 about the, about the father and uh, uh, the husband and wife rather. He shall leave, a uh, man shall leave his father and mother, they shall be joined, uh, joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. But then it goes on and says, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. The union between Christ and the church is that of bride and bridegroom. Now that was never said uh, concerning Israel. Israel is not the bride of Christ. The church is the bride of Christ. Israel, on the other hand, is presented as the wife of Jehovah. And we read uh, many times in the Old Testament verses like Ezekiel 16 here. He says, but thou didst trust in thine own beauty and played the harlot and so forth. In fact, the whole book of Hosea is all about Israel as the wife of Jehovah and how Israel has been unfaithful and, and been the, uh, the harlot. Hosea was commanded by God to go, go and marry a prostitute. And he marries her, and she leaves him, and she goes out and she has affairs with other men. And then he goes and redeems her, he buys her back, and he says, don't sin anymore. You know, this is a picture of, in the Old Testament picture, of Jehovah and Israel, the harlot wife. So the church is the bride, but Israel is the wife of Jehovah. Now, when the rapture takes place, it's going to happen very, very fast. We read in 1 uh, Corinthians 15, 52, it will be in the moment and the twinkling of an eye. And scientists, a number of years ago, according to an article in the Chicago Times newspaper, scientists have invented an instrument that measures the, bl the twinkling of an eye. Now, first of all, they measured a blink of an eye. You know how fast a blink of an eye is? It's one fortieth of a second. Now, a big league ball player comes up to the plate, and if a pitch, fastball's coming in at 95 miles an hour, when the, the pitcher releases that ball, and it has to travel 60 feet, six inches up to the plate, and it's coming at 95 miles an hour, the batter, if once that ball is released, if he blinks, that blink is 1 40th of a second, and he's gonna miss it. Because that blink is all it takes, that 1 40th of a second. But the twinkling of an eye is much, much faster. In fact, it's 7,500 times faster than the blink of an eye. They have measured the twinkling of an eye at three hundred thousandths of one second. Three hundred thousandths of one second. That's the twinkling of an eye. It's not much time. And when that last trumpet sounds, and all God's people that are in the graves are going to be raised up, and then all the living are going to be caught up at that same time, and will be translated into heaven in exactly three hundred thousandths of one second. That's all the time it's going to take. Now that's the scientific definition of a twinkling of an eye. A brother last week, 
after class, he gave me the non-scientific definition of a blinking of an eye. I don't know, you want to hear it? <laughs> Here's the non-scientific definition. You're driving your car, you come to a red light, so you stop. In the car behind you, <laughs> in the car behind you is a woman who is on her way to the shopping mall where they're having a big sale. And when that light changes from red to green, honk! <laughs> that's in a twinkling of an eye. <laughs> All right, that's, that's the non-scientific definition of the twinkling of an eye. But the rapture is going to take place in the twinkling of an eye. The revelation, on the other hand, also talks about the eyes. Notice there, Revelation 1-7. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye, every eye shall see him. Every eye will see him. So it's not going to be that fast. Now, the judgment is going to be fast. Remember what he said about Noah? The day he went into the ark, the flood came. Remember what he said about Lot? The same day that he left the city, the fire and brimstone fell upon the city. The revelation, the judgment there is going to be, it's going to be fast, but not as fast as a twinkling of an eye. Now in between the rapture and the revelation is the seven year tribulation period. And the tribulation period ends with the revelation. When Jesus comes, that's the revelation. Notice with me, Matthew 24 there, right in the middle of the page. Matthew 24, 29 through 31. Jesus said immediately after the tribulation. Immediately. This is how the tribulation period ends. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, Shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from heaven, the powers of heaven shall be shaken, and then, and then what? Shall appear. Here's the word, revelation again. Shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and all the tribes of the earth shall mourn. And look at the next statement there. They shall see. They shall see. They're going to be able to see. Every eye shall see him, Revelation 1, 7 says. They shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. He gathers together his armies up there in heaven, which is the church, to gather us together. And when he, the door opens in heaven and the Son of Man returns, we come with him back down here to the earth. In Zechariah chapter 14, verse 1 through 3, it says, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and the, thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee, for I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished. And then it goes on and says down at the end of the verse, Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations. That's the second coming, or the, the revelation. When that happens, he's going to go forth and fight. And the next verse says, His feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. The touchdown point when Jesus returns is the Mount of Olives. His feet shall stand upon the Mount of Olives. Now, let me give you another great erroneous teaching concerning prophecy that the church has launched onto. Turn with me, if you will, please, to the book of Revelation, chapter 16. Revelation chapter 16. And here is another uh, area uh, that is erroneously taught, although it's not as serious as, as the one we just looked at. But in Revelation 16, verse 16, it says, And he gathered them together unto a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. How many have heard that phrase, the battle of Armageddon? There is no battle of Armageddon. Sorry, you will not find it in the scripture. Now, let me uh, uh, just um, 
add to that a little bit, there were many battles of Armageddon back in the Old Testament. Uh, King Saul and Jonathan were killed in a battle at Armageddon. And uh, Deborah and Barak defeated the enemies there, that, which would be the same place at uh, Megiddo or Armageddon. And, and there's a number of battles that were fought there. There is no future battle of Armageddon. And, it, and this verse doesn't say that. It says, he gathered them together unto a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. We were there last October. And it is amazing. That was a big, wide open plain way back in biblical times. And it is still a big, wide open plain. No buildings on it. A couple of farmhouses, that's all. All that is just wide open. It's just waiting there for all the armies of the world to be gathered together at this place, Armageddon. But that's not where the battle is. The battle is about 55 miles farther south at Jerusalem. Now when Jesus' feet touch down on the Mount of Olives there, Zechariah 14.4, it says, which is before Jerusalem on the east. Between the Mount of Olives and the city of Jerusalem is a valley it's called in the New Testament, the Kidron Valley. And in the Old Testament, it's called the Valley of Jehoshaphat in the book of Joel. It is also called the Valley of Decision in the book of Joel. But this is where the battle is going to take place. The armies of the world gather together at Armageddon and they come that 55 miles toward, south towards Jerusalem. And in that Kidron Valley is where the so-called battle of Armageddon is going to take place. And there's going to be a huge slaughter. And because the Lord Jesus is, is that's who they're trying to, trying to stop. They're trying to prevent the coming of Jesus Christ. And of course, it's no match at all. That's where the Antichrist is defeated. The armies of this world are defeated. And Jesus sets up his kingdom here upon, here upon the earth. So that's another... Uh, erroneous teaching that the battle of Armageddon, the battle takes place in Jerusalem in that valley. That's where in that valley is where we read in the book of Revelation that the blood is going to be as high as the horse's bridle. Uh, that couldn't possibly be true back at Armageddon. That's big, wide open plains. Napoleon visited Armageddon and he looked out and he said, all the armies of the world could maneuver here. Now, I don't know if he knew anything about Bible prophecy or not, but he observed that. He said, boy, what a place. All the armies of the world could maneuver here, and they will. But they're going to head south, and that's where the battle is going to be, is going to be fought. All right, <clears throat> let's continue on. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 uh, uh, through 10. You who are troubled, rest with us. The Lord Jesus shall be revealed. Here's our word, revealed. Revelation shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power and so forth. His coming is to restore Israel. He's coming in judgment. He's going to restore Israel and set his kingdom up there in Jerusalem. You know where it's going to be? Right up on top of that Temple Mount. Well, there's a, the Dome of the Rock is up there now. And uh, sorry, that's going to have to go. Well, we had a Jewish guide one year and we went there. And he looked up at that thing and he says, it's got to go. <laughs> and it is. It is going. And he wasn't even a believer. But it is. It's, go, it's going to go. And um, so uh, that's where Jesus is going to plant his palace, his tabernacle, the, the new temple. All right, in Matthew 16, 28, Jesus said, Verily I say unto you that there are some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see, notice the word see, revelation, till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. That's his kingdom here on earth. Luke 1. Behold, they shall, uh, thou shalt conceive of thy womb, and bring forth a son, and call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, that's here on earth. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob, that's here on earth, forever. And of his kingdom on earth, there shall be no end. Now in Revelation 3.21, 
The scripture says, to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne. This is Jesus speaking. He says, if you're an overcomer, uh, you'll be able to sit with me in my throne. Where is Jesus' throne? It's not in heaven. Jesus' throne is on earth. It's the throne of his father, David. And he goes on in that verse and says, <clears throat> Even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. Jesus today is not sitting on his throne. He is sitting at the right hand of God the Father on his throne in heaven. The Father's throne is in heaven. <coughs> Pardon me. The Father's throne is in heaven and Jesus' throne is here on earth. Jesus' throne is empty. It's been empty since 606 B.C. That was the last king over Israel. He's going to sit upon that throne. The 110th Psalm says... The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. Well, that hasn't happened yet, so Jesus is still sitting on the Father's throne at his right hand, waiting for the time when he shall make all the enemies of God his footstool. That's when he comes back and sits on his throne here upon the earth. Revelation 11:15. the seventh angel sounded, and there was great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world, earthly kingdoms, are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. That's here on the earth, earthly kingdoms. Matthew 19, 28. And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, where is that? On earth, still future, when he shall sit on the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon, look what it says here, 12 thrones. He's talking to the 12 disciples here. He says, you're going to sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. That's here on earth. So the revelation has to do with Jesus coming back to the earth, setting up his kingdom here upon this, the earth. And the 12 apostles, 12 disciples, they're going to be part of that kingdom. The, the, or the apostles, they really don't have a, a, a much to do with the church. The apostle Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. He said in Romans 11:13, I am the apostle of the Gentiles. The 12, they were basically apostles to the Jews. Uh, they were in, their ministry is in regard to Israel. Uh, in Galatians Galatians chapter 2, uh, Paul talks about the gospel of the uncircumcision, that's the Gentiles, as opposed to the gospel of the circumcision, that's the Jews. And he's talking here about Peter. And you have Peter, you have Paul. Paul was sent to the Gentiles. The twelve, headed up by Peter, was sent to, was sent to Israel. That was their ministry. Now the future ministry will be in regard, their future ministry, the twelve, will be in regard to Israel in his kingdom. They're going to be judging the 12 tribes of Israel. All right. Romans 15, 8 tells us, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision. That's the Jews. Jesus didn't, didn't go to the Gentiles. Only on a couple of occasions did he speak to Gentiles. And then with that woman in Matthew 15, he did it reluctantly. He was a minister to the circumcision. Matthew chapter 10, he tells his disciples, don't go to the Gentiles. Go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Why did he do that? Because he was proclaiming the kingdom. But they rejected the king, and so they didn't get the kingdom. And so um, it says, uh, Jesus Christ was the minister of the circumcision to the Jews for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. Who are the fathers? Old Testament Jews. So... Uh, so Jesus, uh, the revelation here has to do with an earthly kingdom. Jesus' second coming back to earth. The rapture has to do with heavenly inheritance being caught up to heaven to beat the Lord in the air. All right. Now, five times in Matthew chapter 24, we are told that nobody knows the day or the hour. Nobody. And in spite of this, Christians are continuously trying to set a date 
of when it's going to take place. Remember, those of you that remember back in 1988, a guy wrote a book called 88 Reasons Why Jesus Will Return in 1988. Well, obviously, it didn't happen, but he had 88 reasons why it was going to happen. All he had to do was read Matthew chapter 5, and he would have read uh, Matthew 24, and he would have read five times here that he's all wet. <laughs> Matthew 24, 36, But the day and the hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven. Even the angels don't know. How presumptuous for men to say, I know when that's going to be. I figured it out. Even the angels in heaven don't know when it is. Matthew 24, 42, Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. Matthew 24, 44, Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Matthew 24, 50, The Lord of that serv servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and an hour that he is not aware of. And yet we still... We still uh, I try to, men still try to predict the date of the second coming. Jesus used the example of the flood, which we, we already read that, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. And he goes on and says, They knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the as coming of the Son of Man be. They didn't know, and as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be today. Now Noah is a type of Israel. Noah was spared the tribulation, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Noah was spared the, the judgment of the flood, but he had to go through the flood. God put him in an ark and he protected him. So he's a, he's a type of the Jews. He, he's going to be here during the tribulation, but he's going to be protected of God during the, the tribulation. But Noah's grandfather was a man by the name of Enoch. And Enoch is a type of the church. He wasn't here for the flood. He was raptured out of here before the flood came. Look at the, on the next page, Hebrews 11:5. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased, that he pleased God. Genesis 5, verse 24 says, And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Noah went through the flood. That's Israel. Enoch was translated out before the flood. And he's a type of the church, or a picture of the church. Isn't it interesting that Enoch lived before Noah did? The rapture is going to take place before the revelation is going to take place. Now, verse 38 there says, The days that were before the flood... They were eating, they were drinking, giving a marriage, and so forth. They didn't have a clue of what was going to happen. And in 1 Thessalonians 5, 3, we read, When they, now who are they? This is the Jews. When they shall say peace and safety. And that word safety is literally security. And Israel is doing everything to obtain safety or security today. They've built a fence over there. And they've made terrible deals to try and trade land for peace, so forth. They want safety. They, they want security. It's not going to happen until the Lord Jesus comes, comes back again. For when they shall say pay, peace and safety, then look what it says, sudden destruction shall come upon them. The day that Noah went into the ark, the flood came. The very day that uh, Lot left Sodom, the fire and brimstone fell. It says, for they, uh, they shall say, peace and safety and um, de destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. So um, we find here um, concerning Noah, the Bible says in Genesis 7, 16, the Lord shut him in. Israel will be protected during that tribulation period. Many of them are going to be killed, but the nation itself will be preserved during that tribulation period. If there is ever a reason why there should be no Jews upon the face of the earth, uh, you, you go through history, uh, they survived the Holocaust, uh, they survived the Spanish Inquisition, uh, they survived survived the pogroms of, of the Tsar over there in Russia. 
Uh, they have survived uh, persecution and so forth. In fact, when um, Peter the Great, he said to his court one day, he says, give me a good reason to believe the Bible. And one of the men in his court says, your majesty, I'll give you a good reason, the Jew. He says, what do you mean? He says, the Jew shouldn't even be here. All that they've gone through. But they're, they're still here. And that was, of course, before the Holocaust ever took place. That was back in the Middle Ages. And what they're going to go through during the tribulation period will make the Holocaust look like a Sunday school picnic. But God's going to preserve the nation. Two-thirds of them are going to be killed during that tribulation period, according to the book of Zechariah and according to the book of Isaiah. Two-thirds of them are going to be killed, but God's going to bring that other third through as a nation with which he <coughs> the Lord is going to set up his kingdom. Now, if the revelation takes place seven years after the rapture, why won't people know that the coming of Jesus is about seven years away? When, once all millions of Christians disappear all over the face of the earth, why won't they know that in about another seven years that the rapture, that, that the revelation is going to take place? Why won't that happen? Well, it's not going to happen. And here's the reason that it's not going to happen. Look at 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 10 through 12. It says, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness and them that perish, because, now notice, it says, they received not. This is past tense. They received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. They received not. When is this? Before the rapture. Up until the rapture. They received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. So the rapture takes place, they're left behind. Okay? Then it goes on and says, and for this cause God shall, now this is future tense, God shall send them strong delusion they should believe a lie that all might be damned. That's future tense. That's what God's going to do. When is he going to do that? After the rapture. Before the rapture, they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. After the rapture, God is going to send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie that all might be damned. And then it goes on and says, who believed not, that's past tense again, who believed not, that's before the rapture came, who believed not the truth but had pleasure in, un, in unrighteousness. And in Revelation chapter 13, verse uh, 13 through 14 there, we read that he maketh fire come down from heaven. This is the false prophet. He maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do. There's going to be satanic miracles taking place here upon the earth. As it says in this verse, God is going to send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. How is that going to take place? 2 Thessalonians 2.9 Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. So it's going to be an age of miracles. An age of satanic miracles is coming upon them that dwell upon the earth. And so um, this is why the scripture says in Matthew 24.39 They knew not when the flood came. Verse 42, ye know not the hour. Verse 44, such an hour as ye think not. And in verse 50, in a day when he looketh not for him, in an hour that he is not aware of. They're not going to be aware of it because they're going to be under satanic delusion. They're going to see miracles and all these things taking place that will be done by the Antichrist and the false prophet uh, through the power of Satan. That's why the scripture teaches those that are here and hear the gospel before the rapture takes place must accept Christ before the rapture takes place because if they, if they are left behind, uh, they're not going to be saved. I heard a guy tell me one time, I witnessed to him, he says to me, well, he says, uh, if all of a sudden millions of people disappear all over the face of the earth, I'll know I need to get saved. And I'll accept Christ. 
I said, no, you won't, because you've heard and you've rejected, and God is going to send a strong delusion, and you will believe a lie, and you'll see miracles, signs, and wonders, all in the name of God, but it will be performed by Satan. I said, and you'll be totally deluded and deceived. So if you're not a believer this morning, well, we believe the, the revelation is close, but that makes the rapture even that much closer. You need to accept Jesus as your Savior while, you, while it is still today. Okay, let's look to God in prayer now, and uh, we'll close in prayer. If you want the two previous lessons, they're up here on the step, and we'll continue this series again next week. With the, we'll begin the reasons. Here's the fourth R, the reasons, and there's many of them the reasons all of this is going to be soon. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you now for the word of God. Lord, we have no other authority but, your, but the Holy Scriptures, and we believe every word in it. Lord, it's let God be true and every man a liar. We believe this book, and we thank you for it. And Lord, we would pray even as we're exhorted to do in Scripture, even so come quickly, Lord Jesus. In thy name we pray, amen. Mm -hmm.